Okay. I mean, if you want to answer a question about you, yeah, you, 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 I, you, I doubt you, I'll have the answer. Yeah, <laughs> we feel the I'm same way. We feel the same way. I'm not Joe Rogan. I don't have all the answers. There we go. <laughs> We should be up now. We waited 30 seconds or so before we get people in. Folks, if, if you are here now, just uh, welcome aboard. Thanks for being with us. Let's just wait a few before we get a full crowd and we'll get going. Should be a fun Wednesday for you. A rare Wednesday appearance for us. So this is great. Oh, we usually do Tuesday, Thursday. So this is awesome, honestly. We okay. It's pretty good. Yes, it's it's good yeah, we, used to, we used to do two, two a day during the height of coronavirus. So we were on 10 times a week and then we. Scaled it back a bit, so this is uh, no. But nobody wants to see you that often. Sorry, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not from your, from me too. No, no yeah, I, 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 I get you. Wait a little bit longer. We should be good to go. Uh, we're gonna have Shane DeMayo in the comments for the commenters that are in here, so he'll be helping us out. Hello, Allison. Welcome aboard. <laughs> um, all right, let's get cracking. Mark Stein, Tom Robleski on the right, Michael Imperioli, longtime actor, right in the middle. You know him from The Sopranos, Goodfellas. Your IMDb is loaded. We were talking about this yesterday. So congratulations on an awesome career and all your, your recent events and, and work. Massive podcast to rewatch on The Sopranos, the book that just came out. You're on tour. You're all over the place these days. You're busy as hell. And we'll get to this a little later. Congratulations on The White Lotus. I have not watched the first season, but it is a priority for mine. So I will get on that soon. So looking forward to the, the next season. Looks like an awesome cast as well. So we can talk about that later if you wish as well. Uh, commenters, we're doing this in promotion of Michael and Steve Sharippa, Vincent Pastor. Am I pronouncing the name right? Yeah. Yes. Coming up on February 12th at the St. George Theater for our subscribers. SRLive.com for that information. Shane DeMeo should be putting that link in the comments. Tom, is that a good intro? Are we good to go? Yeah, this, this, this is good. I, want, I just want maybe Mike, you could tell folks it's in conversation with the Sopranos. So maybe folks don't know what's going on. So tell tell people out there what's going to, when they yeah. come to the theater, what's going to happen. So um, Steve Sharippa, uh, who played Bobby Bacala, and Vincent Pastore, who played uh, Big Pussy, and myself, will be on stage. And um, our friend Joey Cola, who's a, a really great comedian, he usually comes out first and, and um, kind of gets everybody warmed up and he'll do a little comedy and then bring us on. Well, we'll show some clips. Uh, that feature the three of us from The Sopranos. And then we come out and uh, Joey will basically interview us about, um, you know, how we got on the show. What was it like in the beginning? What were we expecting? What was our auditions like? What was our first day on the set like? You know, and then get a little bit more specific, uh, you know, going to the Emmys and, and uh, the finale and all that stuff. And he'll ask us, a, you know, and... Um, uh, and then, and that goes on for quite a while. It gets really in detail about like just behind the scenes stuff, what it was like, what was the experience life uh, experience like as an actor, as a cast member, um, and personally, you know, how, how did it affect our personal lives and, and what, you know, just really giving the audience a sense of what the whole experience was like. And then, which the fun part for me always is uh, we open the show up to the audience and uh the audience kind of takes over and basically can ask us whatever they want um and that's always the funnest part for me because it's the most unpredictable right. you never know what people are going to ask um and uh you know we may not have all the answers but you're welcome to ask and it's a it's a really fun evening we've done it uh, all over the country we've done it in canada we've done this in australia um and um, I think there's an intimacy and a fun to it. There's a lot of humor. It has the spirit of the show, you know. Um, and it's three friends talking about this great experience that they had and, and shared. No, I, I spoke to Steve a couple of weeks ago for a story we wrote ahead of the ahead of the uh, show. One of the things he said is sometimes these fans they seem to know more about the show than even the folks who were in the show. He's like, you get a lot of questions. Oh, you know, season four or episode 13. I mean, does that happen sometimes? They just come up with something that you're like, you're totally stumped? Well, you know, Steve and I did this Talking Sopranos podcast and, and uh, we would answer questions on a weekly basis. We would pick a question of the week. And yeah, you know, Steve and I had not watched the series um, since the initial airing of it. I always watched it you know, once when it came on, you know, 
and then we didn't watch it at all till the podcast. We had to rewatch it so we can, you know, do this podcast about it. But there's fans that have watched the whole thing through many, many, many times. Right, right. So they know the dialogue better than us. They know yeah. the, what's happening in each episode. I mean, obviously, we know what went on behind the scenes, and th they're not privy to that stuff. But it's always fun seeing just how uh, well versed some of these fans are in. <laughs> the ins and outs of that show. And um, um, I, I find it very touching, you know, that people are that, mm. it's that important to people that, and that much of a part of their lives that they, they spent that much time, you know? Was, was there any ever one question where you were like, wow, that's a really great question. Or there was a question that was just like, where does that question come from? That was just kind of just off the wall where, where does this stuff come from? Um, a great question I was asked once was, how, what do you think would have happened to Livia uh, if Nancy Marchand hadn't passed away? Which I had never really thought about wow. because, you know, Nancy and Marchand, who played Livia, Livia was one of the main characters right. you know, uh, in season one and season two. Um, and we got into a discussion about that. And we spoke to David Chase about that a little bit. And, and you know, that just shows how much people are thinking into this show right right i, I mean i know you don't want to you know give away too much you, you people want to come and see the show but everybody must always ask about what your theory of the ending of the show is i don't know if you want to share that or you go back and forth steve talked about it a little bit he says sometimes he goes back and forth a little bit on it i mean i mean i guess that must be one of the top questions that you would get at, at these events <laughs> You know, I, I've gone back and forth, I'll be honest with you. At first, I always thought Tony dies, and this is like the last moments of his life. And But if you think about it, right, you have that guy in the members-only jacket. He's sitting at the counter, and then he wanders to the... It's like, that makes no sense that that guy is the killer, because you're not going to be sitting in a diner ordering coffee or whatever the hell he's doing for a few minutes. You know, you're going to do a hit. You're going to go in and out really quickly, right. you know. Right. So that doesn't really make sense. Um, I've come to the conclusion that what you see is what you get. That's it. There is no, right. you know, everything is hypothetical after that cut to black. Right. Did you enjoy that ending when you first saw it on uh, New Was Coming? Were you like, huh, okay, this is how we're doing it? You know, I kind of knew. I remember talking to David. I asked him at least a year before, how does this end? Do you have an ending? And he said, you know, um, yeah, kind of everything goes to black. And I forgot about that, and I didn't really know what he meant by that. Until <laughs> then we saw, we were, most of us were watching it together as it aired for the first time, you know, with the rest of the audience. And I was like, the fact that we're still talking about this so 15 years later is a testament to how I think effective it was. And I also remember David saying something in reference to the journey song, don't stop believing the line. Oh, the movie never ends. It goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. There's something to that as, as per David Chase said. So we had a couple questions in mind, but I want to get to some of our commenters really quick. There's, there's a couple in here. There's one at the bottom that just came in from rich and our comments as we go back and forth from uh, quite often on, discussion with whatever we're discussing what rank are you in taekwondo i did read that you used taekwondo karate training physical training to quit smoking if i'm not mistaken but i see he's actually answering the, asking the question in relation to that we'll get back uh, to yeah i mean i started doing taekwondo in 2002 um because i was out of shape <laughs> and kind mm. of miserable and then, and I was still smoking. And then I realized I'd ha I had to choose one or the other because it was too hard to do that and still smoke. I tried and still smoke. <laughs> they don't, those two things don't go together. So uh, I, it turned out I liked that a lot more. Um, uh, I am a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. Wow. Good for you, man. You're still practicing often, I guess, or when well, you can. Yeah. My wife and I, um, my wife and I practice almost every day, actually. She's a little bit, she's a, she's third degree, but a little bit, there's, you know, little levels within third in, in our system. So there's third degree, first level, second, and she's a little bit higher level than me. Um, uh, but it, we, we, um, 
we moved to California for a number of years. We live in New York now, but we lived in California for about seven or eight years, and we did a different Korean martial art called Subakta, which is similar but a little bit different. And started as white belts in that, so uh, and um, earned uh, black belt in in that as well. And and uh, now we're back with our old studio in New York, uh, TKT. Taekwondo, Grandmaster Kang in Tribeca, which is mm. one of the best martial arts school anywhere. Awesome. And Tom, I have a, I'm going to pivot, really, you know, staying in the Sopranos mindset, you obviously had another great role in another great mob related movie, uh, Goodfellas, Spider. The, the infamous, just two, like just an amazing run there. Um, really quick, Johnny Ola, Spider, jo Godfather 2, Goodfellas, all links in the Sopranos. Uh, my movies generate to themselves. Could you share anything about being on the Goodfellas set, working with De Niro, Pesci, just Marty, the whole thing? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, you know, for me, I was 23. Uh, I had just started working in film uh, the year before, although I, I had been pursuing acting for six years by then, studying acting for six years, uh, trying to get work and stuff. So, I mean, I, I wasn't... I wasn't new to acting. I was just new to film, really. Um, so these guys, you know, particularly Scorsese and De Niro, those two, um, that was like, I always say it's like going from like minor league being brought up to the World Series and it's Yankees at Yankee Stadium. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For me, that it, that's really the equivalent. Right. Um, being Italian-American kid who grew up in new york on these movies and wanted basically wanted to do that um uh they all were very gracious and kind and made me feel like i belong there especially marty which which i'm really grateful because it could have been uh the first movie i did was a big hollywood director named john alvinson who did rocky the first rocky mm -hmm. and this was a movie called lean on me and i had one line and he was not uh, patient or gracious and not very kind and it was a horrible experience he was just overwhelmed and had i think had too much going on and yeah. um it was terrible and but um you know marty and de niro those were like heroes of mine so the fact that they were really welcoming and warm and kind and made me feel like i belong there really was a, was a big thing for my career you know and, and that's such an enduring role, even though it's a small role. It's it's it, it, it's it's it, it's such it's it's almost as iconic as as all of the other stuff that that's gone on. Is that how you look back at it? Looking back, yeah. When we did it, I had no idea. I didn't even know. I wasn't even sure if it was going to remain in the movie. You don't know where it's going to be in the movie or how prominent. Um, and it was pretty much all improvisation. Hmm. Except for the "go fuck yourself" line, everything else was all improvisation. I'm sorry, I don't know if you could say no, that. No, it's uh, you already said it. It's fine. You're, you can, you can, you're you can, we've seen the movie. <laughs> I'm just quoting the line. Um, everything else was improv and different every take. Um, and I, you know, I think that's why I got the part because during my audition for Scorsese, I knew he liked improvisation because I, you know, I mm. I knew a lot about his movies, his filmmaking process. So in my audition, I did a lot of improvisation. You know, yeah, really was De Niro doing the thing too when he's like, "What is this world coming to?" Was that part of the script too, or did uh, was that kind of? I don't think that script? was even. I don't think anything was in the script. I don't think That's there awesome. were there was dialogue written. For so good. You know? it's, they, they nail it, it's like such a small scene, but it really captures the feel of the movie. So the guys playing cards, you, someone's fetching them drinks. Uh, yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah, that movie was kind of like if you think about it, like peak. For all of them almost you know from marty sure. and de niro and pesci it's just like everybody right at their you know high you know working at their highest level you know and you know scorsese doing that kind of material is just it's just killer you know absolutely pardon the bad pun no it's great Top. And I know surely in, in the in the Sopranos, people must ask you about James Gandolfini. I mean, it, it, we would talk about the mystery ending, and we talk, and it almost seems sometimes it, it, he died so young, so suddenly. It's almost like that loss gets bigger when you think about what he would have been doing, you know, with his career, and even w whether what would have happened with the show. I mean, so what what are some of your you know remembrances and 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 just sort of thoughts about you know working with him? Um. 
Jim and I were really good friends, you know. I mean, I, I acted with Jim more than I've acted with any other actor mm. in my career, probably more than I ever will act with another actor. And um, I'm very grateful for that fact, you know. He, he was, um, he was a, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people think um, uh, Jim and I were a lot closer in age than Christopher and Tony. So, okay. um, so Tony was like a father figure to Christopher in a way and was a lot older. Jim was only a couple of years older than me and not a father figure at all. We were very much kind of, we were in similar places in our career when we got to Sopranos. Mm -hmm. you know, we had done some movies, people had known us, we were getting good reputations. Um, I actually was married and had kids by then and he had not been, he did during the show. Um, but we were much more just kind of peers than you know i you know people said did he give you advice i said you know he it wasn't that kind of relationship it wasn't like right. this mentor kind of disciple relationship at all it was yeah. just a good we had a lot of laughs um we hung out a lot we went out a lot together we had a lot of late nights um a lot of us would go out together very often and usually jim and i would be the last two left at four o'clock. I usually would go home at four. Um, Jim sometimes kept going. <laughs> mm. um, I didn't like to be out when the sun came up. Um, <laughs> uh, but so, once in a while that happened. Uh, but, um, you know, I miss him terribly. It was the worst day of my life, pretty much that 9-11 was when Jim died. Um, those are the two worst days of my life, and uh, to be honest. And, um, you know, Jim and Tony, so it's one of those moments where a really great actor meets a really great role. Right. You know, Tony Soprano being one of the great roles ever in film or television um, for an actor, and, and Jim being one of the best, and those two things coming together. And, and that's what happened there. And that's why people still love this show after all these years. I know uh, you're trying to save some of this stuff for the show itself, St. George. And I get that. It's totally understandable. Um, when you got the role, when you knew James Gandolfini was Tony Soprano, I'm sure you'd seen his work before that. We always I hadn't that. seen his work. You hadn't seen Crimson Tide? No, I, I knew about I've heard. I heard his name. I Actually, that's not true. I saw him do a, a play. It was on the waterfront. They did a play version mm. of Wonderful. My friend had the lead, and Jim played, I think he played the Lee J. Cobb role. Okay. But it, it wasn't a very good production, and um, I, didn't, I didn't know his film work. I hadn't okay. seen, I didn't see True, True Romance or the other films he was in, but I heard good things about him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the, we were talking about him yesterday, the, the career he was having afterwards. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, The White Lotus season two has an actor that he was in a movie with, uh, some UK dark, you know, military related movie that he was in. Uh, he was doing interesting things after The Sopranos. Like, I know he's forever Tony Soprano, but his career was really, really heading in an, in an interesting direction. I know we had a movie with Julia Louis Dreyfus and I think something with Brad Pitt, Tom Hardy. He had a lot of stuff going on. It was really, you know, a tremendous loss, but his. He was so talented. Like it's, we we see him in movies and we talk about him all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Crimson Tide role. So absolute stunner of a, of a performer. Yeah, I you know he was just getting going. You know, I mean he was, what was he fifty two? When he yeah. died, younger than I am now. You know, he was. Um, he had a lot of work in front of him. I mean, he got to do the the Gods of Carnage right after The Sopranos, mm. and. Uh, I remember going backstage after, and he was very happy doing that play. Mm. He said, "I feel like I feel like an actor again." That's what he said. <laughs> you know, meaning not not that the yeah. Sopranos was an acting. Right. It was it was a lot. You know, the experience and doing press and going to awards, and there was a lot of things, other things involved with it. The celebrity that came with the the the, the cult around the Sopranos, and like doing a play, kind of I think for him was going back to his roots as an actor because he was a theater actor first. Right. Um, and, and that meant a lot to him and made him really happy. There's some crazy story I read. You were talking about your late nights where, where an Emmy Award somehow ended up in the, uh, in, in the trash. Was I reading that uh, uh, correctly? Was that after one of those uh, late nights? Uh, you want to tell that story? Or? Uh, that is a true story. Um, 
Yeah, so the, that was the night I won the Emmy, and, and Dre won that year. Jim and Edie didn't win, but we won Best Show for the first time. Can you believe, like, that was season five. So the first mm. four seasons, really? Sopranos did not win Best Show, believe it or not. Uh, so it was, But it was a big night for us because we won Best Show, so everybody was happy, and we stayed up really late, got very drunk, honestly. And then before we went to bed, my wife said... Uh, you know, you won, won this award, all these people kissing your ass and making a big fuss over you. I'm not really, I'm not impressed. And, uh, you know, if you had any guts, you'd take that statue and toss it in the trash. <laughs> so, of course, you know, I rose to that challenge and took it and put it in the, in the garbage pail in the hotel suite. And then uh, the next morning, we passed out. The next morning, she, she woke up and I woke up and she said, uh, can you... Uh, Maybe, can we order room service and some coffee and room service? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. He said, oh, and don't forget, make sure you take your Emmy out of the garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really quick, you got into you mentioned just the the show winning after its fourth or fifth season or whatever. You stepped into HBO. Interesting time. I know I talk about Larry Sanders' show all the time. They were I really it. This is one of my favorite shows. Love ever. It. I was just watching clips the other day. I could the, the company stuff. I mean, I, I could. I swear to God, I love that show. You step I love, into uh, the Jeffrey Tambor in that. He's so mm. good. Rip Torn. I mean, Tom. Right. I know you've never really done the deep dive on Larry Sanders, but it still holds up. Twenty five years later, it's incredible. Um, Sopranos. Really, the opening changing of the game industry. HBO. It's. I know they've had success before that. The movies, some shows, but this one takes them to like a different universe in a way. And you're there for it. Um, I, I guess you, you probably never imagined this would become the TV world, what it became today, but knowing what it's become now, what's it like being there sort of from the beginning 20-something years ago? You know, um, I think, you know, the, the kind of sad thing for me is if you look at, like, some of those early shows, not just HBO, but, like, AMC had Mad Men. Right, the character, you know, the character Don yeah. Draper, uh, which wh who who did Breaking Bad? What channel was that? Was that AMC? AMC as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. AMC was Red Hot. Then that Walking Dead. White. Then you have Tony Soprano. Play though. So you have these three real anti heroes that were really at the forefront of the golden age of television. This new type of storytelling, kind of like cinema level uh, production value. You know writing and acting and production values on tv those three actors if you think about it were relatively unknown mm -hmm. i mean jim had done some movies brian cranston had done you know he was on tv but he wasn't a household name by any means he wasn't like a box office star anything like that. yeah he was the dentist right. and um and yet they became these huge tv stars and what happened was the tv networks became like the movie studio so now it's like you got to have a movie star in the lead of your show you have to have a star in the show right, right. you know rather than just take a risk and have some unknown jim was relatively unknown to the yeah. public right yeah. you know as as were most of us um and, and it's kind of now they're trying to orchestrate it much more like the studios like the movie studios so that's a little bit a little bit of a drag actually. yeah yeah it, it's funny that you mentioned that because I can't help but think like, yeah, HBO is this new show. Imagine, you know, it's about a mob, bunch of mobsters living in New Jersey. Who's the main guy? James Gandolfini? I mean, it, it I guess it it sounds different. 99, 98. 100% sounds different. Yeah. 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 That's why. I, I, I got this. When you guys are together, you, Steve, and, um, and Vin, when you're getting together doing a show, who's the boss? When you three guys are like making decisions, is anybody setting the agenda? Does anybody, or or is it kind of like you guys all sort of share what's going on? Well, I mean, uh, Steve, you know, Steve has experience in entertainment, you know, um, right. so understands what goes into booking a show, what goes into like the relationship between a show and a theater. So he's a good producer that way. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I mean, we 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 do whatever we want to do. You know what I mean? Um, but he's he's been great uh, because he understands, you know, how to give an audience a good show. You know what I mean? In terms of content, there's no boss. I mean, we're 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 
making our own decisions. We talk about what we want to talk about, but he he's a great presence for this because, you know, he's been on both sides of that, this type of uh, right. production, and that's that's been really helpful. Tom, you have anything else before I get to the question I've been doing? No, go ahead. And, and again, how much more time we have, Michael, just, just let us know. This, is, this has been a really great uh, experience so far. Yeah, and, fantastic. And, and, and then the, the comments are reflecting that. So, um, But yeah, we, we really do appreciate it. I'm going to get to one of the questions and comments in a second, but I, I was burning through a bunch of Spike Lee movies a year, year and a half ago in the, in the worst parts, of the worser parts of the pandemic. And I get across clockers, and I was kind of blown away by clockers. Uh, reminds me of The Wire years later, just like a movie version to a degree. You were in that with Keitel, Daryl Lindo, to just a ton of great actors. You worked with Spike five, six times, I think. What's Six times, yeah. Six times, um, which is fascinating. You were in, I saw you a little role in Malcolm X and, and Jungle Fever and whatnot. If you could just say like a little bit about working with Spike, and he uses a lot of guys often. One of the guys that you worked with in Goodfellas, I guess, didn't share a scene with him, was Samuel Jackson. And we see what happened to him years later. But if you could just reflect on the experience of working with Spike, New York guy as well. Uh, yeah, a lot of the actors from Goodfellas wound up in Jungle Fever because Spike was ca Spike cast Jungle Fever right around when Goodfellas was screening privately. Like, and, and Marty and Spike were friends, so Marty showed it to Goodfellas in advance screening to Spike. And he wound up casting. We had Debbie Mazar me frank vincent uh samuel jackson but he probably um well that was his first movie with sam jackson i think or maybe sam might have been in malcolm x i'm not uh, sure. do the right thing i think he was in yeah so yeah. um and i'm sure i'm missing a few there might have been some other actors that were in it as well but um uh spike likes improvisation as well he likes a lot of input from his actors and uh gives them a lot of freedom which, you know, I appreciate, as do most people who are. And he's very loyal, which a lot of people are not in show business. <laughs> a lot of people say they'll work with you again, right. but they don't. And uh, I have a lot of respect for him as an artist. I think he's someone who's always really done what he's wanted to do, rather than, um, you know, he's done, he, he's gone from big budget movies to really small, you know, almost independent level movies. Um, which I admire as well. He's done documentaries. He's, you know, he, he was one of the first people to experiment with video. Like Bamboozled was done on like some kind of video, you know, for really low budget after he'd already done, you know, some really big movies. Yeah, he got um, Game, I think, was before that or something. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's gone back and forth to and and he's I think just a really quintessential New York artist. That's you know a legend now. Tom, you have uh, any other things? I have a comment from Mike here as a retired NYPD detective sergeant at the one precinct at uh, 911. Your cast, I guess 911, your cast came down to ground zero in the first precinct. Um, it says, what a moral be I'm, I'm not sure what he, I, I think he's thanking you, honestly, and, and he's just, you know, recalling that moment. Um, so shout out to Mike. Thank you for the comment. Any, any, any you remember anything from that, from, from visiting? Uh, I didn't visit with the cast. I had a different relationship to. I had to. I was evacuated in nine eleven. I lived very close to the world. Okay, Day and um, um, had to get my family out of there that day. Uh, wow. I was recommended by the police to get my family out of my house. Um, I saw the second plane hit the World Trade Center, and um, got everybody out. We couldn't leave Manhattan because everything was closed, the bridges and tunnels. So we wanted to go to Brooklyn to my in-laws, but uh, my this we wound up finding a hotel. It took a long time to find a hotel to stay somewhere that night. With I had three, my youngest was two year, two weeks old, Oof. and um, finally the next day they went out to Brooklyn, and I. Uh, I went down to check on the house and wound up working um, with the uh, Red Cross for a couple of days. At Stuyvesant High School became like this medical unit kind of, we were unloading trucks and bringing supplies to the workers and stuff like that. So um, mm -hmm. um, that was my experience there. It was, um, Man, just a yeah. terrible, terrible, terrible day. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you, what you did, what I did witness and take away was an incredible amount of bravery, 
by all the, you know, the, the cops and the firemen and the, you know, the EMTs and whoever was down there working. And in, especially in the early days when everything was so uncertain and scary and, um, you know, when the shit hits the fan, you know, people in New York really can rise to the occasion like no other. I really believe that. And I've, mm-hmm. I've seen it firsthand and come together in ways that are very moving and important. Seems like a long time ago, that aspect of it. Sometimes you wonder if that would ever, how that could ever happen. You know, these days, things, just, I don't want to get political, but it's like, it's, it's it, yeah. it brings it to mind, you know? Yeah, it is. I mean, although I'll tell you the truth. Um, since the you know since the pandemic and during the pandemic i've been in a lot of different places and i've been amazed for a giant city like new york how uh vigilant and respectful of each other for the most part mm. uh, new yorkers are in terms of just you know wearing a mask and um understanding that you know sometimes you wear a mask just for out of respect to someone else not just because of your own belief and whether you think that or not that there's some kind there's a there's a level of also courtesy in that Right. member of a community uh and i feel new yorkers have really done very well with that for the, i mean especially in the early part of it right. um, and then you witness again the bravery and dedication and sacrifice of you know the health workers frontline health workers man it's sure i mean they were bombarded you know yeah we, we very scary that. time and very vulnerable very dangerous things and they put their lives on the line so, yeah, that's a New York. Those are New Yorkers too. Absolutely. I, we know you got a, a minute left. We have one. I don't know uh, we can go a little longer if you want to. I mean, you it's want up, to go yeah. till twelve forty. Sure. Yeah, twelve forty. We got another few minutes. Right, uh, nice. I don't know if you can answer this one now, or you want to hold it for the the show itself. How cold were you during the Pine Barrens episode? We were freezing during the Pine <laughs> Barrens. We shot that in upstate New York near West Point, uh, and it was not supposed to snow. Well, it wasn't it wasn't written for the snow. It was shot in the winter, so anything could happen, obviously. And they were almost going to cancel or postpone the shooting, and then they realized, wait a second. This is actually a blessing because this is a fish-out-of-water episode, and the, obviously the snow made them even more, made the environment even more alien and threatening to these guys. So it was pretty cold. How many days were you out there? How, how long? Oh, you- a while. I don't remember exactly, but we were there for quite a while. <laughs> but He's the interior it. of the van, those scenes with Tony Sirico and I inside the van, that was shot on the stage. So we were pretending to be cold in those scenes. Oh, okay. Did, did you always know what Christopher's uh, storyline was going to be? The, the, the arc that it was, I mean, because he, like I said, he, he was in some of the top storylines um of, no, of, of no, the not show and you know the girlfriend everything i mean you this was always kind of a surprise season by season for you yeah i don't think any of that was mapped out i think they you know david chase and the other writers would would get together before the season and start to map out what that season was going to be um you know i got cast in the pilot we shot the pilot i wasn't sure if we were going to get picked up we got picked up i wasn't sure i remember in episode two so the pilot was shot in summer 98 we didn't shoot the rest of the season episode two through 13 till the summer 99 right hbo had to make their decision right and i think since episode two anthony desando who's a great actor and a, and a lovely guy he came on as brendan falone i was kind of convinced that he was going to replace me as like the young the main young guy on the show right because <laughs> actors are insecure and paranoid and all of course, that. Yeah. um so i didn't really know how big a part it was going to be till i think it was episode eight season one was the legend of tennessee multisante which really featured christopher and his writing aspirations and things like that and, and that was a big deal because it was you know he was the main storyline in that episode and i was like oh wow i i, I wasn't so sure that that ever was going to happen right and um, you they, know, like me, they like me after all, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you never know. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit, you mentioned Breaking Bad. I think Aaron Paul's character was supposed to, he wasn't sure, they weren't sure if he would stick around more than a year or whatever. And it turns out absolutely essential to the to the fabric of the show. Yeah, you never know. You know, and actors are very, 
I guess because you go through so much rejection, or at least I did, and a lot of the people I know. You know, Charles Grodin wrote a book, a oh, memoir about nice. acting, and it was called It Would Be So Nice If You Weren't Here. Because he always felt like that was what the casting people or the directors were thinking when he would go to audition for a part. <laughs> Which is not really the case, but you start to think that because... You get rejected a lot. I mean, I, I certainly did for years. Did, did you know uh, Charles Grodin? I, I'm a huge, like I tell, I feel bad. Tom is, is being berated by, uh, I'm a huge Midnight Run fan. I can watch that movie any day, any time, you name it. Uh, I didn't I know Charles like, Grodin, but I, I certainly liked him in that. And yeah. Rosemary's Baby, I thought he was really good in too. He's great. Right, rest in peace. Uh, we have a comment here, Law & Order related. Some, someone saying, was lo I love you in Law & Order. And mm. Kathy's asking, any plans, anything in the future of returning to the Law & Order family? No, no. <laughs> well, that's a quick answer. There you go. <laughs> I, I mean, it's that's either a yes or a no, and it's a, right. I, I don't have it's. A, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm just saying there's no plans for it. I enjoyed it a lot, um, especially liked working. Uh, got got to work with Jerry Orbach mm. uh, yeah. and uh, and Dennis Farina, uh, both of whom yep. I, I really liked a lot and and uh, and miss a lot, both of them. What are you uh, what are you watching these days? Any any shows you, you have an eye on? Uh, I just watched the the new and final season of Afterlife, Ricky Gervais's show, and I liked okay. that a lot. I thought that was really good. Uh, ending was very moving. Um, um, and I just saw I watched the White Lotus recently because uh, I had to um, audition for it. Um, so before I did the audition, um, I watched it. I hadn't seen it, and I like that very much and so i'm excited to be uh excited to be a part of it it's a new cast right is, is this a new like i didn't watch the first uh season i have to do this i keep telling my girlfriend to watch it it's mostly a new cast i new think cast. there's one or two people who are gonna come back uh at least one i think um mostly a new cast i'm gonna be working with uh f murray abraham who's yeah. my father so i'm um very excited about that he's Phenomenal actor, um, and uh, we're shooting in Sicily, wow. which I love. I've been there. I've been to the city where we're going to shoot it, and uh, that's. I, I've 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 come up unlucky on a lot of locations and been to some kind of not so <laughs> romantic or glamorous ones, but this the, I kind of hit the jackpot on this one. Tom, anything else you have? We have a couple minutes left. I I, I think I think we're good. I mean, you get to Staten Island much. I mean, uh, we, you know, Staten Island sort of has the, the the almost the mob reputation out here as well. The yeah. mob bedroom, they call it. You know, I have not spent much time in Staten Island to be honest. Probably out of all the boroughs, I've spent the least time there. My because my family uh, was mostly in the Bronx. Okay. Um, you know, um, and uh, Queens and Brooklyn are a lot more closer to Manhattan, and you know, going sure. out. Um, Brooklyn a lot for a lot of different things but no I, I did shoot um, we did a movie about Sammy the Bull called Witness to the Mob that uh, Sirico was in and Vinnie Pastor Nick Turturro played Sammy the Bull mm -hmm. Debbie Mazar was in it Catherine Narducci a lot a lot of uh, Frank Vincent a lot of soprano people uh, and we shot a lot of that in Staten Island yeah. so I did spend some time working there uh, really quick, we, we know you have a minute left. Frank Vincent, you mentioned him a couple times. I get a kick out of him whenever I see him on screen. Whether he was screaming and do the right thing or he's running around with Joe Pesci in Casino. Any any stories about him? Any, anything you can share with us about that or you want to save that? I, I don't. You know, Frank was um, a musician, a drummer, and Frank and Joe Pesci had a... They had kind of like a musical comedy act that they did for... Um, in the 70s, I think. But... What I will say about Frank is um, I've heard from a couple of people actually involved in organized crime who really think Frank was a very <laughs> accurate portrayal of a mobster. They really enjoyed how he did it and just yeah. felt he got it right. More than a lot of other actors. So He, he has the menacing look sometimes. He does have that look. Menacing, but just eyes. whatever the... <laughs> You know, he carries himself like a wise guy, like a captain or something like that. There's something in his bearing that people really believe, you know. Yeah. Dude, I uh, appreciate you joining us. It's just Thank you for having fun. me. It was a lot of fun. Congratulations on the podcast, the book, the tour.
you got a lot of places you got to go to. I see the UK is coming up in the summer. It seems like you're really busy ahead. UK is canceled or postponed. Oh, oh postponed. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Because All right, of well. the, yeah, I mean, the COVID, of, yeah. And, yeah. And some other issues, but uh, Fair enough. that's not going to happen now. Maybe it'll happen in the future. Um, for those of you who are into music, you know, uh, I play uh, in a band called Zopa, and we have a special concert happening. February 17th in Brooklyn at Baby's All Right in Williamsburg. And we're cool. going to be a video release, video and single release party concert. So you can go right. to Baby's All Right on Instagram or uh, their website and come see us if you like. February 17th is a Thursday night. Fantastic. So Feb, Feb 12 at the St. George Theater, you can see that. And then you can see this, you can see the show, uh, the, the concert the next week. Yeah. And if you're in Philly, which is not that far away. On the 18th of February, we're going to be at Kung Fu Necktie, which is a rock club in Philadelphia. So. What do you play? What's your instrument? What do I you, play uh... guitar. There oh, go. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, um, the, mu like, the music must be a, a wonderful um, break from acting in some way, right? Just, just a little different, just kind of shredding and, and playing with the... It's a lot know? different and, a lo yeah. and similar in many ways. You know, being on stage performing is similar. But, uh, you know, because it's just us. We, we write, I mean, most of it's original material, so it's it, there's no producers or directors or executive. It's just us doing what we want. It's just you guys. Yeah, which right. is freedom, you know, and fun. Awesome. Awesome. We'll leave it there, sir. Thank right. you. Thank Have you very much. Time. Take care. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the 12th. Thanks very see much, later. Michael. All Take right. it easy, buddy. And folks, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Uh, Tommy, want to recap anything before we go? Oh, I, I, you know, I don't think that could have gone any better again. I think it was awesome. Absolutely uh, fantastic. Conversation with the Sopranos, uh, February 12th at St. George Theater. Or go on SILive.com to find out how uh, subscribers can win free tickets. Uh, Shane DeMeo was uh, taking care of that uh, for us as well and other giveaways and stuff. And we're looking forward to it. And listen, I don't, listen. The guy gave us his time. We talked about, you know, the Sopranos. We talked we about got every sort of, question we wanted. The whole, the, whole, the whole career, I was starting to run out of questions, and that doesn't happen very often when you've got, you know, when you got a fellow like that uh, around. So uh, we, we very much appreciate the time. And, uh, you know, and we look forward to the show ourselves. And we're going to be back tomorrow yes. for our regular Wanderers at, at, at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're still in quarantine uh, protocol, so we'll be home. We appreciate folks continuing to watch, even though the background doesn't change. But we appreciate that. Yeah, we try to keep things flexible here. Uh, today was it was a, a unique episode, a unique chance for us to do something. St. George Theater in the comments, uh, they're thanking us. We're thanking them. Everyone's very happy about this. So he was great. I we, we folks for those listening, we plan out a bunch of questions. We're not sure if we're going to get to this one, that one. You know, sometimes we don't have as much time. He gave us more time than we expected, was more which was absolutely right. awesome. So shout out to Michael again. And we got every question we wanted in and. He had a hell of a career. He's had a hell of a career, and it's still going. So we're still and, I, and I didn't point out that you actually like Casino better than Goodfellas. I was going to jump in there and say, you know, Mark <laughs> thinks Casino is a better movie. I, I think they're, you know, I, you're not in Casino. You I, know. I think they're. I think they hang with each. I think they're nice, like yin and yang almost. It's degree. a definite one. It's definitely a one and a one you, you, a as far as I will I'm say. Concerned. You don't listen. You 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 wouldn't have Casino without Goodfellas. And it wouldn't be the like casino wouldn't lead to good. Like okay. you need good fellows first, right? That's the anchor. And, and again, we appreciate Michael's time, and we appreciate uh, Steve Sharippo who talked to us for another story about the Sopranos. We appreciate everybody tuning in, uh, Sopranos fans, and we really um, <laughs> there you go. Yep, we were we really appreciate Shane. We appreciate Shane DeMeo, You know our pal, our brother, doing all the stuff in the background uh, with with the contest and also. Uh, other things. I know he's working with Jason on some stuff as well. So we're gonna we, we, we're gonna. There's more stuff coming uh, in terms of the uh, the Sopranos. We appreciate Vin and the ladies down at the St. George no Theater. No doubt. Um, as always, the, you know they're friends. And uh, listen, happy ending, man. Absolutely, folks. Thank you very much for joining us. SILive.com for the latest. SILive.com/slash/subscribe to subscribe. Uh, hopefully, have more events like this coming up in the future. Uh, geared towards subscribers and potential subscribers. So we're trying to look out for you as you're looking out for us. We really, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you to Michael Perioli once again. Tom, anything you want to send off with? We're all set, right? We're all good. And you, you, you even got all your questions in about Spike Lee. Dude, I mean, that was, was like, less. You, you, yeah. You got, you're, you're talking to Charles Groden. I mean, you went, I mean, he went level. Larry Sanders like, show. <laughs> you got Larry Sanders. You, you're leaving me in the dust on some of it these was, things. So that was good. No, I, I mean, you have a career for 30 years in this business. I, I 
he's been all over the place. And the, he always seems like a kid to me still, though. I know he looks, he's got the beard and everything, but I always think of him as the young guy. So yeah. That's yeah. Like, and talking about Dennis Farina, it's like, talk about a guy who could have been in The Sopranos. Wow. Even Jerry Orbach, too. Talk about two guys who were like, yeah. were classic TV actors who could have easily, especially Dennis Farina, he could have been in any of those, uh, in any of those movies or any of those TV shows. Yeah. No, him, and to mention uh, Groden, him, Tambor, like a lot of guys, sadly, many of them are with us anymore. Frank Vincent's no longer with us anymore. Um, Frank Vincent really got a, a lot of, you know, because he has that Spike Lee Scorsese thing. Those two guys gave him a ton of opportunities. And in Casino, he mm. finally gets his big one to get back at Pesci on, on screen. Yet those guys were like buddies for decades before that. So it's, it's I always get a kick out of all that stuff in the back. The show, well, he, he's he's an iconic character in the uh, in the Sopranos, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the Shah, I mean, he's really and his demise is really, you know, is really one of the classic yeah. scenes. You got to watch the Sopranos. I got to do. Man. It. I'll, I gotta do I'll, it. I'll, I'll 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 do you know whatever you know the other show that you uh, you were talking about. I'll 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 do that. But uh, you got to watch. Uh, I got to gotta watch. It. You got to watch the Sopranos. Got to do it, folks. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'll All right, kids. Thanks. Tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <sighs>